Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. I like having that acknowledgement. You know what, here we are, we're at session number 70 for me. So, um, you know, I'm trying to make sure we keep the same enthusiasm as we go through these ones here. And we're also getting the added benefit is that we're having this event here recorded here today. So, look forward to having that reference available for uh, many of our members that aren't able to make it. So, my name is Bob Lickers. I'm out of the uh, uh, Carry Enforcement Program Office in St. Catharines. I am a licensed mechanic. I've been licensed since 1988. So being a licensed mechanic, that got me the Motor Vehicle Inspection Station program as part of my portfolio. And our office in St. Catharines delivers the training for both industry and our, as well, our police partners and internally as well. So that's kind of a little bit about my background. What we're going to be doing today is talking about the changes that impact your industry when it comes to safety inspections on passenger vehicles and light duty commercial vehicles. These changes become effective July the 1st. So what we are in now is the education period. The regulation has been um, reviewed and it has been posted. The light duty standard is also available on our website and has been available there since October. And as I said, these changes come into play on July the 1st, 2016. We're gonna talk about some of the features of the light duty standard. We're also gonna talk about how we came up with the light duty standard and then we're going to go through it. Now, one of the weaknesses I think within this industry is administration. So we're gonna spend a little bit of time um, with that as well. And we're also gonna share some of the resources that we have that we've put in place with the ministry in, in our effort to make us more efficient as well and better communicators. I usually like to start off just by getting an idea from the crowd. How many of us in here work at a facility that uh, conducts safety inspections of both commercial motor vehicles that require annual inspections and passenger vehicle safety inspections. You just raise your hands and let me know how many we have in the crowd in here. Nice, thank you. So we have better than half of the crowd, so that's great. Uh, that's gonna make it very easy for us because a lot of the, sim the uh, similarities between the light duty standard and National Safety Code Standard 11, they cross streams a lot. And we used National Safety Code Standard 11 as the model for building this product for the light duty standard. So there's no secret about it. Regulation 611, Schedule 1 and 2, is what you currently use for safety inspections. You will continue to use that until the end of June. It is antiquated. It's an antiquated piece of legislation. It's been, it hasn't been rewritten in probably close to 40 years. It was time for something to uh, bridge that gap to deal with technology that has advanced. This light duty standard is the product of a number of consultations with a number of working groups and different associations as well. So as a result of that, working groups and those consultations, there have been a number of edits to the light duty standard. So the, the reference material I wanna make sure that you have, if you go to our website and you download it to your computer or you've printed it, make sure that you have the October 2015 as the reference date on the front cover of that standard, okay? Because that is the one that is referenced in our regulation and that's the one that's available on our website as well. Now, as I said, there have been a number of consultation periods held with this. And uh, we've, we've very much engaged other associations with this. And we, the one basic that we have on this is that um, safety certificates, there are two reasons why you're going to need a safety inspection for a vehicle. First, you're gonna be doing maybe a, uh, an ownership transfer. And when you're doing the ownership transfer, you want to make it into a fit plated vehicle, you need a safety standard certificate. And if you're gonna do a status change, that's the second reason why. So if you wanna change the status from a vehicle to an unfit status to a fit status, this would also require a safety standard certificate. Okay? So that's kind of the basic information that we wanted to start off with in here. Now, as we're going through this session, I want you to know, even though we have a little bit more of an intimate group in here, there are occasions in here, you know what, I do welcome comments and I do welcome questions and I encourage some dialogue. All that I ask for is that, you know what, um, that we just keep it uh, with some courtesy as we go throughout. That's the only ground rule I have for this, okay? So some of the key features. First of all, as I mentioned, Regulations uh, 611, Schedule 1 and 2, effective July the 1st, that's going to be revoked. Okay. That is the criteria that you use right now, and you will continue to use that. Okay. It has some special meaning for enforcement officers and our police partners, though, Schedule 1 and 2, because that is what we use for doing roadside inspections and to determine if there is a violation of any legislation. 
So having said that, it's important to realize that the light duty standard and National Safety Code Standard 11 are not on-road enforcement tools. Okay? Schedule 1 and 2, are although, although they are being revoked from regulation, they are going into another regulation, and that will continue to be our on-road legislation when we do our inspections. Now, there's some changes that come along with this as well. So we'll just go over a couple of high-level parts of that, and we'll feel, um, develop them further into the presentation. Effective July the 1st, vehicles that get certified with a light duty standard, they're going to be required to produce a vehicle inspection report as well. Now, this vehicle inspection report has some good news and some bad news. So seeing as how we've had the number of sessions before this, I know your anticipated response. I'm just going to tell you the bad news first. The bad news is, is that the Ministry of Transportation is not going to be providing you with this inspection report. Now, I have an explanation for it, and it comes up a little bit further in the presentation. But what this has done, and sort of the good news part of it, is that this has created an opportunity for different associations to do activities for their members. Whether you are a member of the Used Car Dealer Association, the UCDA, um, Automotive Aftermarket Retailers of Ontario Association, Aero, or Trillium Automotive Dealers Associations, TADA. These are three associations that have stepped up for their members and they are producing vehicle inspection reports. You do not have to be a member to purchase them or to obtain them, but being a member certainly gives you some um, enhanced pricing or possibly, as Diane mentioned, through Arrow, if you're a member, they're free. Okay. Now, you don't have to use one of those associations, you are certainly uh, more than able to generate your own report in whatever format you want to have, as long as it has the required information. And through the presentation, I will highlight what that required information is, okay, when we get to that part of it. But we have to embrace these changes. So I look at the vehicle inspection report now, is that the vehicle inspection report is going to do the public serving good that the safety standard certificate doesn't do. Many people, when they have purchased a used vehicle and they feel they bought a certified vehicle, they feel they bought a good vehicle and they're very much mistaken. So when they start to call into our office and they have complaints about that and they find out that the vehicle only has to meet a minimum standard, they get upset at that. And then when they find out that it's not a guarantee or a warranty, that frustrates them even more. So really, this vehicle inspection report, the intention of this is to communicate to the customer what the condition is of that vehicle that, of details that are not captured in the safety standards certificate. So when we think about that, the minimum information that goes on there, it'll include brake information, uh, tire tread depth, these types of measurements will be on there, any telltales that are active during the inspection, and we'll find out more about those as we go through as well. But that's intended to communicate to the customer what the condition is of the vehicle when you do your inspection. Okay? There's a couple other requirements that come along with this as well. There's a road test element in this. Now, we realize that technicians already do road tests. We know that. What we have now is a standardized set of criteria that will, that will be applied through the industry province-wide, and that's what we're looking for, is to make sure that we have something standardized to go across for all road users. There's also a requirement for window tint, um, for measuring window tint. So there's a new tool required, and we'll go over that when we get into section number eight as well. When we talked about the working group that we had for this, we had vehicle standards engineers from our office engaged with us. One of the nice things about them is that they have an awesome connection with Transport Canada. So anything that is federally required on a motor vehicle has built-in inspection criteria in this new modified light duty standard. Well, actually, take out the word modified. This light duty standard, okay? And that is very refreshing. So there's also some information that comes along with that. We put in some background information on them. Now, this does not take the place of any federal inspections for imported vehicles. This is our provincial inspection criteria that applies to passenger vehicles and light duty commercial vehicles only. Those are the only changes. So regulation 611, although it's being modified to adapt the light duty standard, it still contains our inspection criteria in there for motorcycles and for structural inspections. So we still need regulation 611 going forward, okay? This has also resulted in some changes to Regulation 601, and we'll address those as we get to that part of it as well. Okay. 
There's been a couple of questions that have come up at our sessions prior to this slide, and I just thought I'd just address a couple of them here now. So many people have thought, with these changes to the safety inspections, are there changes to the safety inspection certificates? And the quick answer to that is no. The six, so continue to utilize your inventory of safety certificates, continue ordering them in your prescribed way, making sure that you have stock on hand that you don't run out. Now, do I see that changing down the road? Yes, I do. I see the ministry developing some sort of efficient plan that'll probably model the Ministry of Environment with their electronic certificates. But that's down the road a little ways, and that'll be communicated out to industry certainly well before that happens. We'll get back into this now, getting back into our deck as we continue with the development of this. Now, our manager that oversaw this project, her name was Rhonda Lindsay. Now, Rhonda is not a mechanic, she is not a lawyer, and she is not an engineer. She's a manager. And as a manager, she wanted to make sure that we had um, specific goals. And those goals included making sure that this light duty standard would still provide an effective inspection while not adding anything laborious to the process, which would in turn add cost to the customer. We wanted to avoid that. We wanted to make sure that this transition would also be easy to accept for the technicians as well as easily understood by the public. So about approximately a year ago, we gave a draft version of this light duty standard to a working group in Eastern Ontario. And we asked them, use this criteria for us, do your safety inspections for this, and let us know what you think about it. Suggest some edits, give us some feedback, and overall, uh, they used the product for a little better than two months, and the feedback that we received was very positive. They did suggest some edits, and where we were able to make those without any difficulty, we did. Now, they also gave us a suggestion as to the extra time required to do a safety inspection. Their suggestion to us was that it averaged 10 minutes utilizing the new standard. And I very much subscribe to that feedback that we received from them. Now, that conflicts with a number of rumors out there. So there are some rumors that go on thinking that a safety inspection now is gonna take upwards of three hours to inspect a vehicle. And I challenge those people that I think you have to give the standard an honest look. The vehicle hasn't changed. We're still inspecting brakes, tires, wheels, suspension, frame, glass, electrical items. Those are still our inspection items. What's changed is our inspection criteria what we go to check for for compliance. You're already measuring brake components and you're probably writing them down on some sort of a piece of paper, some form. Well, now it has to go on to prescribed report. Okay? That's, those are the couple of the changes right there. And, you know, and I think that once you come up with your systematic flow of doing your safety inspection, you're gonna find that probably giving it an honest look that that estimate is not too far off. Now, as I said, overall, the feedback was positive, and that's what we have going forward with it. When I said at the beginning about the uh, um, vehicle inspection reports not being made available by the ministry, the simple reason is for the Ministry of Transportation and for any public service to post anything on our website for public use requires an accessibility check. It must be what we call AODA compliant. And the short story long is that we cannot get a fillable form to pass AODA compliance on our public website. So a decision was made that we are not going to provide the vehicle inspection report. That created the opportunity for the different associations that I, associations that I mentioned earlier, whether it's uh, the UCDA, Trillium, or Arrow. They are stepped up to the plate and they are providing these inspection reports for, the, for their consumers and for their members, okay? Having said that, our light duty standard is an accessible document. So within the document, you'll notice that it has a specific font, specific size of font, specific colors, any images have alternative text built into them, specific spacing. It's all within here, it is a 100% compliant document. That makes it a very bland document, okay? So unfortunately, that's how the rules with public service go for our documents. But this is what the cover of it would look like, except it'll say the October 2015 reference date on the front cover as well. I've divided this presentation into thirds. Our first third is we're gonna focus on the instructions to technicians. 
These are in the first 11 pages and the inspection methods as well. The model that we used with National Safety Code Standard 11, very similar to this as well. So that's what, you know, those of us that are familiar with commercial motor vehicle inspections and Standard 11, you'll see a lot of those references where I can re um, refer back to as we go through the different sections, okay? Sections one through 10 are inspection item sections. They mirror Standard 11. The, the inspection process is primarily a visual inspection unless there are additional inspection steps identified and we'll make sure you understand where those are as we go through here as well. We have section 11 which is our road test. Our road test has the same criteria that we would apply across the province and gain. We want it to be standardized when it comes down to that part of it. And this is something that I think as technicians we may struggle with, having a strict pass or fail type of criteria. Okay, when we're doing the inspection on this vehicle, we're not predicting the future condition of it down the road. We are certifying the vehicle as it is in our shop right now. And that's what's gonna be communicated to the customer on the vehicle inspection report, okay? Now I realize, actually the ministry realizes that there are, um, there are basically, there are three levels of safety inspections See, using the same criteria. Okay. You've got the person that has sold the vehicle. If they're selling the vehicle and that vehicle meets minimum criteria, they want their safety certificate. And then you've got the person that has bought the vehicle and they've bought the vehicle, they need it certified. And you know what, they want reliability with it. They want peace of mind. They, they want that extra effort put into it. They want customer satisfaction as well. But then you have what I call a dealership inspection. Dealership inspection, they don't want the comebacks, they don't want the headaches, they want happy customers, they want peace of mind to go out the road. They want their referrals. So if it doesn't have 50% worth of tire tread depth or 50% worth of brakes on there, you know what, that's what they're saying, replace it, make it. We don't want the headaches. But it's all the same criteria and that'll be communicated to them in July after with the vehicle inspection report as well, okay? As we go through the standard, just navigating through the index, you'll notice that we have the same section title numbers, sections one through 10, same as the National Safety Code, with the addition of section 11, which is our road test. We also thought that it would be very important to make sure we have a consistent way of um, referencing within the standard. So when a, if a technician has a question about an item, and in this example here, I'm gonna use the ignition switch. If, if you have a question about the ignition switch, it's very important that we have a standardized way of referencing that. So don't try to tell me what page you're on. If you call in and you wanna know about this and wanna discuss it, don't tell me what page you're on because chances are, if you're talking with me, I'm gonna be using the electronic version of this document. Pages won't help. Tell me the location. Tell me the item that you're looking at, okay? The best way to be able to do that, first of all, you're in section number one. The section number is identified across the top of each page as you go through for the criteria. We're looking at item number six, which is our engine shutdown. Paragraph A is the ignition switch. So any of our enforcement officers or any of our police partners or anyone who's attended the previous sessions before now, it'd be very common for them to say, we are want to talk about, I have a question about 16A. Once I hear you say that, I am in the same page, I am in the same reference material, I know exactly what we're talking about. So don't try to tell me on what page number, tell me the item, okay? These sections are divided into two columns. We've got a left-hand column, which is our item and method of inspection, and then we have a right-hand um, column, which is our reject if criteria. Now, as I mentioned, these are primarily visual inspections, okay? And the nice thing about this standard as well is that when it comes to the reject if criteria, I think you have to agree that when you have a look at this, the reject if criteria does a really good job of removing any ambiguity when it comes to de interpretations or determining whether it's a defect. Does a really good job of identifying the item and identifying the inspection technique and identifying the reject if criteria. If it meets the reject if criteria, it fails. It's just that simple, okay? So we no longer have to worry about hearing expressions like, um, it's a gray area. I think that we've removed a lot of the ambiguity with uh, the adoption of the uh, new standard. As I mentioned, they're primarily a visual inspection unless 
we have additional inspection procedures identified. Now these will be in the top left hand column for each inspection item. These additional inspection procedures may include taking, uh, making a test, taking a measurement, making a record of that measurement, but they will be in the top left hand column for each inspection item. Now this column is also utilized for providing any background information on that inspection item as well. So whether it's a federal inspection item or when it became a federal inspection item is included in there as background information. We're dealing with used vehicles and as used vehicles we wanted to make sure that we had a standardized way of referencing defects. If you're using the PDF version or the electronic version of the document and you come across words that are identified as, as such right here where they are bold, print, italicized, and underlined, in the PDF or electronic version, those are hyperlinks. Clicking on those words will take you to the definition section within the standard. Now, if you're using the printed format and you see that type of a format, that's saying that these words are defined conditions and they are within the definition section of the standard. So when we go to look at something like that, we'll see that inoperative has its own definition. Missing has its own definition. Now, as within this definitions, there is um, also reference to vehicle standards, um, federal vehicle standards, as well as national associations. They're also within definitions, but we tried to capture most of the common defect characteristics that we would see when it comes to doing an inspection on a vehicle. Definitions certainly makes it clear for everyone that we're singing from the same reference books when it comes down to that material okay, across the province. Continuing with used vehicles and defect characteristics, there may be the occasion when we're going to look at some different fluid leaks. Using standard 11 as our model again, these leaks are defined by different levels. So we've got a level one, level two, and a level three type of a leak. A level one leak means that we have seepage but no drops. Level two means we've got seepage and drops, but these drops, they don't fall during the inspection. And then a level three means that we've got drops falling during the inspection. Okay. Now these are defect characteristics and they would be found throughout the standard in the reject if criteria as a defect characteristic. And I've got a couple of references as we go through to show examples of what we have on that. We have a defective hose and tube chart in here as well. This hose and tube chart is divided into three columns. The left hand column shows a physical cross section of that hose or tube. Our middle column gives a physical description of that hose or tube. And then the right hand column identifies what the defect characteristics are. What would cause that hose or tube to fail the inspection? Okay. Primarily with passenger vehicles, light duty commercial vehicles, we'll be dealing with a type one and type seven. There are occasions in the standard where you have to take measurements. These measurements are often to a certain tolerance and it depends on the type of um, item or tolerance that is defined within the standard. As I said, they're defined. Now, this standard is an Ontario document. That comes with some benefits. It makes it easy for Ontario to modify this document and edit it. We don't have to seek national approval. We have a process we have to follow, but it makes it ours to be able to make those edits to it. Being in an Ontario document, it's also in metric. Now, we're not saying that you have to go out and buy new metric tools to operate a motor vehicle inspection station. But what we are saying is, is that tools that you have will give an accuracy to a tolerance as indicated within the standard. Now, when you were licensed as a motor vehicle inspection station, you had to prove to the ministry that you had tools that were accurately able to measure to thousandths of an inch. That is not going to change. The application criteria is going to remain the same. However, those tools exceed their tolerance within the standard. Now, as I said, these tolerances are defined. Large distance measurements, these are defined as being greater than 25 millimeters and now we need accuracy to the nearest tens. Short distance measurements go from one to 25 millimeters and we need accuracy to the nearest whole millimeter. And precise short distance measurements, they go from 1.0 to 25.0 where we need accuracy to the nearest tenth of a millimeter. And then for our micro distance measurements, anything less than one millimeter, we need accuracy to the nearest hundredth of a millimeter. Now, for those of us that might be a little bit like me and a little stubborn when it comes to metric measurements, 
I have to be honest with you. I approached the working group and I said, you know what, when I saw this, and I read through the manual and I said, is there any chance that we could think about this product being left in imperial measurements? Our industry is pretty comfortable with imperial. So they looked at me and they said, you know what, Bob, that's a pretty good idea and we value your input. No. So what they did is they threw me a bone. There's a conversion table included in this. Now this conversion table is the same thing that's in National Safety Code Standard 11, but I'm gonna take the sole credit for it being in our light duty standard. So we'll call this Bob's table from here forward, okay? But there it is if you want to have the imperial part. That's a really quick overview of our first 11 pages of the standard. What we're gonna do now is we'll go through the standard and we'll go through the different sections. When it comes to those sections, on the title page, I'll identify what the section um, items are with inspection. And then if there's anything that we need to know going forward in those sections, I'll do, it'll be on a separate slide. Okay. Um, so within section number one, powertrain, you'll notice the number of items that we have up here. So these include exhaust, drivetrain, accelerator inspection, all the way down to alternative fuels and alternative drive lines. These are the inspection items within section number one. The first thing that we need to realize is that within here, that inspection report that the Ministry of Transportation is not going to provide to you, somewhere on there you have to indicate what the fuel level is when you do your inspection. Now, we're not saying you have to fill the fuel tank up, we're just saying you have to record on the report what the fuel tank level was when you're doing your safety inspection on the vehicle. We have exhaust system mentioned on here because exhaust is one of the first spots where it talks about a different type of a leak. A turbo cannot have a level two coolant or oil leak. Um, that would cause it to fail the inspection. Our enhanced criteria also includes diesel equipped uh, for DEF systems for their uh, criteria, inspection criteria as well. Drive shaft is included in here and it also includes CV joints and axles as inspection criteria. An alternative powertrain and alternative drive line um, alternative fuels, they have inspection criteria in here as well. And there's a lot of references through those sections pertaining to original equipment and even including maintenance requirements as well. So if you work at a facility that certifies those vehicles, a lot more enhanced information when it comes to doing safety inspections on those types of vehicles. Section number two is suspension. Within suspension, we've got our suspension and frame attachments, axle attaching and tracking components, spring, spring attachment, air suspension, and um, strut and shock absorber inspection. One of the most common questions that we have received within our office is whether a vehicle can be raised or lowered and still be certified after July the 1st. That has been, uh, many of my colleagues have mentioned that same thing. They are getting that question a lot. So we have spoken to almost um, 11,000 people during these sessions so far. So everyone that's been at these ones, I'm hoping that those questions will start to weed out now because you know 11,000 is a pretty good number. In a nutshell, yes, a vehicle can be raised and a vehicle can be lowered and still receive certification. There are two references within the standard that talk about ride height. The first one talks about inspecting ride height from side to side. There's a tolerance for that. And the second one, and it actually says that the vehicle will be factory ride height if the vehicle is equipped with factory air suspension. And so if it has factory air suspension, it'll be factory ride height as well. Okay. So those are the two spots that talk about that. Now, if you have a client that brings in a vehicle and it's been raised or it's been lowered, you still have inspection criteria for that. It is still a suspension. It'll still need to have inspecting. If it has springs, you'll have to inspect the springs. Frame attachments, you'll have to inspect the frame attachments. We do not have a modified vehicle inspection standard. Okay? This is our criteria that we have for this. Now, unfortunately, many in industry and public, it, we may start to develop a modified vehicle standard. And I have to be honest with you, I, I don't want to work on that one. I don't want to be the one that says that's an acceptable modification or this is a non-acceptable modification. So I just challenge you to please um, love this criteria for six more years and then I'm gone and uh, others can develop this and follow along and, and uh, build it from there. But 
any modifications on a vehicle, I want to find it all, I want to stress as well that any modifications, you're going to be doing an inspection on them, you're going to make sure that they are thorough modifications. Nothing is broken, nothing is loose, nothing impacts any other vehicle system component on the vehicle. So if it's lowered, you're going to make sure you know what, your exhaust or your frame isn't dragging on the road. If it's raised, you're going to have full range of steering and um, nothing is going to be affecting your brakes, those types of things, okay? So it's still a pretty basic inspection when it comes down to that part of it. Section number three is brakes. Within brakes, we have a general brake inspection, we have disc brake information in here, drum brake information, different types of assist, and it also talks about parking brake, ABS, and electronic stability control. These are the inspection items within section number three. When we're doing a brake inspection, there is going to be some disassembly required. The nice thing about this is, is that it makes it very simple for us. If you have drum brakes, the wheels are gonna come off, the drums are gonna come off, you're gonna do a brake inspection. You're going to measure the drum diameter and you're gonna measure the friction material remaining on the brake shoes. Those dimensions will be recorded on the inspection report. If it has disc brakes, the wheels are gonna come off, measure the rotors, measure the inner and outer pad. Those dimensions will also be recorded on the inspection report. We have different types of assist are identified as well as their inspection criteria, as well as we have new requirements in here for ABS. Now with ABS, it is important to realize, and this is communicated in this section, ABS is not federally required on motor vehicles or vehicles unless it has a gross vehicle weight rating over 4,536 kilograms It was manufactured after a specific date, and that's mentioned in the standard. Now, we left this in here because there was, um, there was a reason for it. When we adopted National Safety Code Standard 11, there was a vehicle that was missed as needing inspection, and that was the recreational vehicle. We decided when we reopened this regulation this time that we would bridge that gap. The easiest way for us to incorporate that into inspection criteria, we felt, was by the brake type. So within Regulation 611, it states that if a recreational vehicle is manufactured with air brakes, it will direct you to National Safety Code Standard 11 as the criteria for safety checks for that one. If you have a recreational vehicle that has hydraulic brakes, utilize the light duty standard for your inspection criteria. Now, some of those recreational vehicles may exceed 4,536 kilograms, and therefore ABS is an inspection item for that. Okay. Having the ABS light on, though, is not a cause for fail for vehicles that don't federally require it. What this is, is a telltale. Telltales will be recorded on the inspection report. And you'll notice there's a comment in there. It says, ABS light being on is not a cause to fail the vehicle, but pay attention to this during the road test, section 11, to make sure that foundation braking is not severely affected by this code being on. The one thing I want to specify with this part of it is that this criteria is not vehicle specific. It is a generic set of criteria. So at one of our earlier sessions, we had one of our techs ask the question about, what about the GM pickup? And I asked for some clarification. I said, I need a couple more details. What's wrong with the GM pickup? And he said, sometimes you'll get a false, break at, false ABS activation when you're pulling slowly up to a stop. And I said, okay, well, let's go through this systematically. I said, does the light cycle during your lamp check? And he said, yes. Is the light on during your inspection? No. And I said, then I don't think it's gonna get captured during the safety inspection because as I understand, it's an intermittent problem and it's electronic. And um, he looked and he said, okay. And many people in that crowd disagreed. So I looked and I said, our criteria is not vehicle specific. It doesn't tell you if you're driving a GM pickup for a safety check to approach a stop slowly to make sure you don't have a false ABS activation. It doesn't tell you that. And that is not part of the criteria. I had good luck that night because there was a GM tech in the room that self-identified. 
And this GM tech said that there's a service bulletin out about it, and he went on to share the details of it, that there is something that is affecting the air gap between the sensor and the ring on the front wheels and the rotors. And he went on to relay a little bit of the knowledge that he had as far as how to correct that situation. So then I asked that technician, how old is that service bulletin? It's 14 years old. And I thought, oh my goodness, don't treat the safety inspection as the time to do maintenance, especially when it's a 14 year old bulletin. You know, that's part of the maintenance that I think would be going on. And that's not the intent of a safety inspection. Our safety inspection goes to minimum criteria. That fault, I think, would be maintenance. Okay? And certainly if I had a technician that was servicing my vehicle for that, I would hope that we'd be dealing with that before a safety inspection is being done on it. Okay? Um, there are also criteria within the standard that deals with electronic stability control. Now, electronic stability control is federally required on a vehicle manufactured on or after September 1, 2011. Since it's a Transport Canada requirement, Transport Canada came up with the test requirements and it's very simple. Cycle the key. When you do the cycle of the key, it does the lamp check, it does the diagnostic, and then we have reject diff criteria if one of those two things doesn't function properly during the inspection. Now it's important to make sure that it's federally required. So if you have ESC on a vehicle built before September 1, 2011, it doesn't apply to that. But on federally required, we have the criteria for it. Many people within this industry as well are struggling with the parking brake inspection. And I make sure I address us at each one of our sessions going in. Parking brakes, particularly the drum and rotor type of a parking brake, is a two-part inspection process. If you look at that section, it says that there is a performance test element to this. The performance test means that you are going to have the vehicle running, apply the parking brake, put it into a forward gear and a reverse gear, and with no additional throttle above idle, the parking brake will hold the vehicle. When you release the parking brake, the vehicle is released. That is the minimum requirements for the performance test. There are notes right there that say, do not disassemble. Okay. The second part of that is still a visual element. So now when the vehicle is up on the air, we're going to be checking the cables, checking the levers, checking the pivots, making sure that we have equal braking application to the rotors. And that's part B of our inspection. So that continues with our visual inspection. Now, we don't want you removing the rotors during the safety inspection for a simple reason. We don't want a defect to be created during the safety inspection. Many of you may realize that if you go to take that rotor off, sometimes there's a lip on that uh, parking brake drum, or perhaps that parking brake lining may have a bit of a adhesion problem and falls off when you take them off. So we don't want that defect created during the safety inspection. Parking brakes are required to be maintained according to the Highway Traffic Act. So I mean like doing routine brake inspections on these vehicles should include parking brake inspection as well. And that would hopefully, pre you know, if, if more of us would subscribe to that, we would come across as being a little bit more diligent and um, we wouldn't have to worry too much about these situations like that. But during the safety inspection, that is what we determine as being the minimum requirements to prove that we have effect, an effective parking brake. If it doesn't pass one of those two elements, it fails. Okay. That takes care of our brake requirements. Getting us into section number four, which is our steering, which deals with our items including in, uh, steering control and linkage, power steering system, steering operation, and our kingpin inspection. Within section four, the steering op um, criteria is enhanced to include rack and pinion steering criteria, including leaks in the clamps and in the bellows. Uh, no level two leaks present. It also includes uh, steering dampener inspection as well as remote steering systems. Uh, upper strut bearings have enhanced inspection criteria as well as steering wheel free play or the steering lash has inspection criteria within section four as well. Section five is instruments and auxiliary equipment. Within here, we deal with the horn switch, speedometer, and odometer. 
Now, at that same session where I had people asking about the ABS on the GM vehicle, I also had a technician ask, what about the Toyota? What about the Toyota that goes up to 299,999K, won't go 300? In our criteria, it says that the speedometer and odometer shall function as originally equipped from the manufacturer. I was very fortunate at this session because there was a Toyota tech there and said, there is a service bulletin out on this. Other than I said, okay, you know what, share that, please. So when your Toyota product gets up to 299, 999,000 kilometers, the Toyota bulletin replaced the speedometer. Just that simple. And I thought, wow, that's pretty uh, straightforward. And he said, yeah. And again, that bulletin's been out for a little while. And uh, I thought, well, that's part of the routine maintenance. You know, if that's, what, that's a vehicle you have and that's the condition you get up to, that's part of the maintenance on that product. We deal with windshield wipers as the inspection criteria in here as well. We only have one windshield on a vehicle, okay? Many people think that the rear wiper on an SUV or a minivan is part of a safety inspection. It is not. We are dealing with the only windshield on the vehicle, the one in front of us. Okay? Coolant leaks from all heaters, fuel leakage from auxiliary heaters, keeping in mind that this criteria also applies to recreational vehicles. That could be a, one of those conditions that this comes into apply to. And then we have PTO inspection. The PTO, we are not checking the operation of the PTO. We're checking to make sure that it is secure, that there are no leaks, there are no exposed wires, and there is nothing going to negatively affect any of the occupants within the vehicle. Okay. Section six is lamps. Within section six, we have inspection criteria for the required lamps, the reflex reflectors, as well as instrument panel lamps, headlamp aim, and there are three lighting tables included in here. Now, these three lighting tables, the first one is for vehicles that are less than 2.05 meters wide, and the second one is federal lighting requirements for vehicles that are over 2.05 meters wide. And then the third table gives the number of lights and the location for those lights. Now these are condensed references from the Transport Canada federal lighting requirements and they've been included in the standard here for our reference. Now there are three sections, three times in this presentation when I get on my soapbox. This is number one. When it comes to headlamping, Many of our motor vehicle inspection stations, when you were first licensed, you had to show to the ministry that you had either the space or the tools to effectively check headlamp alignment. Many of you may have went out and purchased a standalone headlamp aimer. And when the Ministry of Transportation would show up at your inspection station to approve, you would produce the headlamp aimer. And in some cases, you know what, it might even still be in the box but you have it and so we approve. But I know it might come as a little bit of a surprise. Sometimes when the Ministry of Transportation leaves, I think the headlamp aimer leaves shortly after we do. And that kind of gets, kind of showed up a couple of times because a number of my colleagues have similar experiences, but I only want to share this one with you. And it deals with a time when I was uh, doing an inspection at a garage and this, garage was in like an industrial plaza. So we have multiple units in this plaza. So for whatever reason I was at this garage, when I was finished my um, inspection, we also do a routine audit on the tools and equipment. So I'll ask the service manager, okay, we're gonna check tools and equipment, need to see your headlamp hammer, please. So the service manager called in for his, for his uh, apprentice and he says, um, hey Rook, we need the headlamp hammer. Can you go and get the headlamp hammer out? And he winks at him. Now the rookie apprentice has two options as to where he goes. He'll go into the back storage room and he'll move all the boxes and parts and everything else like that and clear a path out so he can bring the headlamp hammer out. Or what happened with me at this garage you hear the door at the back of the shop open, footsteps, and then you hear the door at the back of the neighbor's shop open, and then I imagine the conversation went something like, hey, uh, we've got MTO next door, can we borrow your headlamp aimer? And then the doors open and close and then they come. Now, I'll play along with them on that. I'll be like, okay. 
If that's the headlamp aimer you want to show me, that's fine. You can do that. But just as a little FYI, I am going to go to your neighbor's unit. And it's really kind of entertaining watching some of the reactions that I get when I walk in. So as I walk out of shop number one, I can hear the doors closed and open, open and closed, going into the other units, returning the headlamp hammer. And lo and behold, in shop number two now, here I am, and the service manager looks and there's MTO standing in the front lobby thinking, oh, hi. And I'm thinking, hey, how you doing? Just in the area today. Thought I'd do a little routine audit on tools and equipment. Let's start with your headlamp aimer. And he'll look and he'll say, yeah, sure, it's right here. I've got it out. And I say, of course you do. So we'll go over there and I'll continue to play along. And I'll look at the technician when I get over there and I said, so this is the headlamp aimer you want to show me? And he said, yep. And I said, okay. I said, you know what? There must have been a sale on these headlamp aimers. Because the serial number on this one is really close to the, your neighbors. And you can just kind of see them go a little deflated and you're thinking, and they're thinking, busted. And I'm thinking, uh, yes, you are. So I don't care who owns this headlamp hammer. I really don't. But by the end of this audit and by the end of the rest of my visits to the other garages in this little plaza, each motor vehicle inspection station is going to have their own headlamp hammer in there. And then I'll do my best Arnold Schwarzenegger voice that I can do. I'll be back. So I finished the rest of my audits that day. And it was kind of funny because about an hour and a half after these audits, I got a phone call from a local jobber. And he said, is this Bob from MTO? And I said, yes, it is. He said, yeah, um, I'm with uh, some supply. And I said, OK. He said, I'm curious. How many garages are you going to go into? Uh, um, I don't know why. And he said, I get a pricing break if I order more than 10 of these headlamp aimers. I looked and I said, you know what, go ahead. I think you're going to need them. And it was kind of interesting, you know, because so I did go back there and it was kind of interesting. But we can joke about that, but it is a regulation requirement to have a headlamp aimer or the space to check headlamp aim. That is part of the inspection criteria. You must have it. Okay. The criteria says the check headlamp aim. It does not say that you aim the headlights as part of the safety inspection. That's a separate task. If it fails the headlamp aim inspection, it fails. Now, if it takes $35, $40 for each headlamp aim after that, you know what? That headlamp aimer starts to chip away at some of the rent that it's taking up in that storage space doing nothing. So I always say that to him. You know, like there's an opportunity for that thing to start making some money. Let's get into section number seven, which is your electrical system. Within electrical system, we're inspecting the wiring and we're inspecting the battery. Inspecting the wiring in general inspection, you know, what checking the condition of it uh, for the battery, the same thing. Pretty basic inspection criteria for the battery as well. Section number eight is body. It is a huge section, and I actually I don't even have all of the inspection items listed on this slide for, for this. But in a nutshell, if it's attached to the body, it has inspection criteria for it. Okay. There is also some specific requirements for structural integrity of the passenger body, the frame, subframe, tailgate, bumper, and seats. So there's inspection criteria in there for that. Now, many people in the industry have been getting um, concerned about that additional images and pictures that are in there showing the repair sections in 8.2. And many people think that, you know, when it says that, you know, you cannot repair a hole that is greater than 200 millimeters in a floor, many people think that as being like that condemns the vehicle. That's not the intent. What we're saying is, is that if you have a hole that exceeds 200 millimeters in the passenger or driver's floor, you cannot repair that. That has structurally compromised the integrity of that area. So you cannot repair a hole that size. You replace that floor section. And it includes the criteria for the firewall, the cowl, and the rocker panel. And that's how it's intended to be communicated out there. Okay, So those types of rust in, 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 that may exist, it doesn't condemn the vehicle. It just says that there has to be an effective professional repair when it comes to doing the inspections on that part of it. 
This uh, Section 8 also includes inspection criteria for the entire windshield, including the passenger wiper sweep. It's also another spot that includes an image, and it shows some examples of defects that can be present when a safety is issued, as well as some pass and some fail criteria in there for references. Window tint is a part of this criteria as well. This is where I just kind of dictate to you. Effective July 1st, 2016, motor vehicle inspection stations must be equipped with a window tint meter. Do you mind, can we just agree on that? Can you just agree with me? That's the voice of the majority, I'll take it. Yes. Within the criteria, it states that window tint criteria does not apply to vehicles manufactured before January 1, 2017. So can we just agree on that as well? Okay, thank you. Okay, so there's probably gonna be a period of time where you're not gonna have window tint criteria to measure, but you need to have this tool, right? The Highway Traffic Act deals with excessive window tint and it will continue to apply with vehicles manufactured before January 1, 2017. Keep in mind, this criteria is not on road enforcement criteria. This is for a safety certificate to be issued. So probably one of those vehicles manufactured after January 1, 2017 won't need a safety certificate until at least you know March, maybe even at the earliest of 2017. But you're gonna need a window tint meter prior to that. You need that window tint meter July 1. So what I say to people is, July 1, you need the window tint meter, you have to have it. You're not gonna have criteria to use on that until vehicles are manufactured after January 1, 2017. So get the window tint meter, store it beside your headlamp aimer. Finally, I have a pulse out there, okay. You need it. Now there are different tools out there that are available to industry and these tools have caused some confusion within industry as well as to what is required. Now for our tech savvy people that are gonna say, you know what, there's an app for that, I have to agree with you. Yes, there is an app for checking window tint. But when you check the fine print on that part of it, you'll realize that that window tint measurement does not give you the tolerance required as measured reference within the standard. Within the standard it says that you check window tint on the side windows to make sure that we don't have any uh, light transmittance cannot be restricted more than 70%. Is that right? Yeah. No. Window tint will allow for 70% light transmittance. That's the word, sorry. Okay. So the, win the device you get will measure window tint in a percent of light transmittance. Okay. Now we're checking the windows that are forward of the driver's seat back. Okay. So the ones that are behind, they can be privacy glass, they can be black, but the ones beside the driver and our windshield are the ones that we inspect. Any tint, any aftermarket tint on a vehicle manufactured after January 1, 2017, aftermarket tint will fail that vehicle. That gives you a couple options as to what tool you need to have. There are one piece units and there are two piece units out there. The one piece unit needs an edge of glass to slide over. Okay, so that'll work. So the one piece unit, I kind of, re I, I refer to it looking like a clamp. It'll slide over the edge of glass and it'll take a measurement of the window tint. The two piece units, they attract by magnets and they attach onto a fixed piece of glass and they will take their measurements as well. Now these give a tolerance reflective of within the standard. Okay, so that gives us our percentage of light transmittance. The one piece is going to do the minimum requirements that you need to do because as I said, for the windshield, any aftermarket tint on the windshield on a vehicle manufactured after January 1, 2017 will fail. Okay. SRS systems are also part of the uh, Section 8 and this is basically a lamp check for uh, airbags. Okay, So that's part of the inspection criteria as well in Section number 8. Section number nine is our tires and our wheels. Within this, we have the tire tread depth, tread condition, sidewall, and inflation pressure. And then for the wheel, we've got the hub, bearing, rim, and fasteners. These are the inspection items. Within here, we'll notice that effective July the 1st, one spot of tire tread depth in a major tread groove of less than two millimeters will fail the tire. Up until the end of June, you need to have two adjacent tread grooves 
three equal spaces around the tire, one and a half millimeters. So there's some enhancements when it comes to that part of it as far as overall tread measurement. But we're just dealing with tread in a major tread groove for the tread depth, okay? Two millimeters is the minimum requirement. We are not measuring the wear bar indicators. We are measuring to the deepest part of the tread. And for those of us that may not wonder, that may not be familiar with what a major tread groove is, it's defined in the standard, but we're looking at the deepest part of the tread groove, okay? There, there, and there. I had some questions about that in the earlier sessions, and they said, what's a major tread groove? And I thought, really? And I said, yeah. So ever since then, I've been pointing that out as we go through these sessions. That's a major tread groove. When it comes to checking of the tread condition, we're making sure that we have no recapped or rebuilt um, treads, no exposed cord or missing tread sections. This is the inspection criteria as well. It does talk about cracks in the treads, uh, and it cannot be uh, exposing cord, and it will be a certain dimension as well. One of the common questions that we've received as well is, what about the, the date stamp? Do we inspect the date stamp? And no, we do not. It is not an inspection criteria for tires. Uh, sidewall for proper size and condition, and these are referenced within here. We talk about the vehicle compliance label, and we also talk about the wheel and tire manufacturer for proper size fit application. Okay. Tire inflation pressure, this is going, you're checking for leaks in the tires, making sure we don't have any obvious leaks that the tires are able to maintain pressure. And it also mentions TPMS. TPMS is not a federal requirement. So if a vehicle has a TPMS light on, this is not a cause to fail the vehicle. That's a telltale. That'll be recorded on the inspection report. The customer is going to be aware of that, okay? Tire tread depth and tire inflation pressure will be recorded on the inspection report. Okay. Now there's some special notes that go along with that as well, and they're within that section. Now, when it comes time for this, this is my third spot where I get on my soapbox. In Ontario, if a commercial motor vehicle loses a wheel, there's a wheel separation report that gets submitted to the Ministry of Transportation. It gets submitted to me. I'm that guy that receives them. Now, I don't know if this will surprise you or offend you, but so far in Ontario, we've had 57 wheel separations from commercial motor vehicles that have been reported to us. Those are the ones that have been reported. That doesn't include the wheel separations that have been prevented by our police partners and by our Ministry of Transportation colleagues. I've received 14 of those inspection reports. Actually, my latest one was last night from uh, the Sarnia Truck Inspection Station. A truck went through there. Six of the 10 wheel fasteners were broken, and it only had four remaining on this thing, and this was driving down the highway. So these, that, was a, that was only a few kilometers away from being a, a fastener failure. It may also may surprise you that, um, you know, in the past six years that I've been tracking these stats, 75% of the wheel separations have been caused by fastener failure. So either the stud breaks or the fastener works loose and elongates the stud holes and then the wheel or the rim may um, pull off right over the fastener or the fastener falls off and then the wheel just walks off. 75% fasteners. Okay. Now I talk about this because of what's happened in Ontario in the last nine months. We've had three people killed by wheels coming off of commercial motor vehicles. And I strongly feel that those were three preventable wheel separations. We need to make sure that we have drivers doing their proper daily inspections. We need to make sure companies have proper maintenance policies in place. And we need to make sure that technicians follow proper, daily, proper installation techniques. Okay, Taking the necessary precautions to make sure that we have proper torque proper clean surfaces, okay? That's why I challenge us all to make sure that we do as we, when we come to this part of it. I fantasize about having a year of wheel separations at a zero. I don't think I'm gonna get it, but it would be nice to see these numbers come back down, okay? And certainly, you know, when you think about these three deaths that have happened within the uh, last nine months, you know, we had a long time where we had um, 
um, we didn't have a loss of life from commercial motor vehicle wheel separations. But it doesn't take long for that to happen, and it doesn't take long for that to become international news. So in Ontario, right now, this is not the time to have a vehicle with a loose or missing wheel fastener. You will come under a lot of negative attention for that. Whether it's a commercial motor vehicle, some of the penalties can include um, penalties up to, to $20,000 fines. And I gotta be honest with you, you will bring a lot of extra negative attention if you're a commercial motor vehicle operator and you lose a wheel. Okay. So I just ask us to be diligent when we're doing our reinspections and our installations for tires and our wheels. Section number 10 is coupling devices. When it comes to coupling devices, these include uh, the different types of hitches and they're identified in the standard. We're inspecting what we see, okay? Now when we say broken, loose, or missing, not having the hitch in the receiver, as what I have in our Google image up here, that is not counted as loose or missing, okay? That was just part of a Google image that I liked and I left it there. So that the hitch doesn't have to actually be in the receiver at the time, okay? We're inspecting it to make sure nothing is broken, loose, missing components. Fifth wheel, it says there may be some requirement for specialized tools. We are not hooking up a trailer to check the operation of it. We are not checking the rating of the trailer hitch. We are inspecting what we see. Section number 11 is our road test. I have this slide divided up for a very specific reason. Do you have to have a driver's license to do a safety inspection? A lot of people shaking their head yes, a couple, a couple whispered yes, so I, you know. So what I have to say to that is, is that you need Highway Traffic Act compliance if you go on the highway. Do you have to go on the highway to do all the elements of the road test? 40 kilometers per hour, full right, full left, at least one heavy brake application, and then going over a bump over five centimeters, many of the, that criteria can be met in, in many parking lots. Okay, so you don't have to go on the highway. Now, the scenario changes a little bit because I like to make sure that we're aware of this as well. Suppose now you have a technician who is under, um, is the subject of a criminal code prohibition on driving. Can they still do a safety? And if you're not familiar with what a criminal code prohibition is on driving, then you know what, I, I commend you, good for you. But basically, if you have a criminal code prohibition, you're not driving anything, anywhere. Private property, parking lot, parking garage, you're not driving it. Okay. We sought advice on this, and even though the technician isn't able to do the road test, we, de we, de we deemed that he could be a participant in the road test, passenger. And as long as the driver meets the criteria for the road test, that technician can still do the safety inspection, sign the safety. Okay. Now, recording any telltale indicators that indicate a fault, that is also included in the road test part of this. This is designed to be an introduction and an overview to the National Safety Code, to the, the uh, light duty standard, sorry. Okay. There's more information in there to be found out. That's a really quick overview of the first 11 sections for the light duty standard. I wanna dedicate a little bit of time here now to the inspection report. The inspection report, as I said at the beginning, one copy is gonna become part of your maintenance records at the motor vehicle inspection station. The second copy is gonna to go to the customer. There's required information on there and there are two sections that you have to be aware of for the required information. Regulation 601, section 9.1, lays out the minimum requirements and it states that the inspection report will include the date of the inspection, the vehicle description by VIN year, make and model, it'll include the odometer reading at the end of the inspection, and you know what, if it's a Toyota, make sure it's not 299.999. When it comes to doing the measurements, it says measurements as required. That's your hint that you need to reference somewhere else to get that other information. This is saying that measurements as required, those are within the light duty standard, okay? The mechanic's name and trade code number will be recorded. For the trade code number, we mean your 310S 
and the certificate number that follows, or your 310T and the certificate number that follows. We do not mean your Ontario College of Trades membership number. We do not mean 999A, okay? 310S or 310T. The motor vehicle inspection stations can be identified by their name, address, phone number, and by their station license number. It'll also indicate whether this was a pass or a fail or a subsequent inspection. So the scenario can come up. What if you do a safety inspection on a vehicle and it fails? The customer takes the vehicle and they do their repairs and they bring it back to you within 10 days. Do you need to do a new inspection report? I sought some advice on that part of it and it was decided, no, you do not need to do a new inspection report. You can make edits to the original. This allows you to say whether it is a pass fail or a subsequent inspection. Well, we're gonna edit this. Now we're gonna edit the date, edit the mileage, and now that the vehicle passes, we're gonna record the safety number, the serial number on the uh, inspection report. Now within regulation, it states that if you bring the vehicle back within 10 days, you are going to reinspect for free what caused that vehicle to fail. It's free unless you have to remove the wheels to do a brake inspection. Then you can charge shop time to do that inspection. Now, if you're servicing the brakes or have to measure the brakes for the safety inspection report, we need measurements on there, okay? So do not write down new for that. We need the actual measurements, okay? The rest of the information, we went through the uh, light duty standard and I indicated to you what had to be recorded on the report. Telltales indicating a fault will be recorded on the report. The fuel tank level, tire tread depth, tire inflation pressure, disc brake information, drum brake information, and if we weren't sure what telltales were, there's a whole Christmas tree of them there just to show you what they are. Okay. When it comes to the record keeping and the administration part, a lot of these we went over already, but one of the big changes in here is that any certificates structurals, annuals, semi-annuals, or safeties, any of those that have been issued to you by the ministry that you have not issued to a customer yet must be at the license premise. And anything that you have issued must be at the license premise for one year from the date of issue. Those are the maintenance retire, um, retention requirements, okay? Now, if you're a fleet station and you have a commercial motor vehicle fleet, there are other maintenance requirements for those documents, and that goes for two years. But if your core business is a motor vehicle inspection station and motor vehicle inspection station only, one year from the date of issue. That's what has to be retained. We talked as well about the requirement and the contents for the inspection report, as well as the new tool being the window tint meter. Some of the resources that we've put in place. Four years ago, we made a decision from the ministry we are no longer providing printed documents. That created a, a gap within industry and it caused some inconvenience to motor vehicle inspection stations. And as a ministry, we decided that the best way to bridge that gap is to create a website with a homepage for motor vehicle inspection stations. This website is now up and active and you can get there by going to ontario.ca slash MVIS for the English or Ontario.ca slash SIVA for the French. There are useful links on there, useful um, information as well as frequently asked questions. You can obtain, you can download the light duty standard, you can download it as many times as you wish, print it as many times as you wish, it's there for your download. We want this website to be your best source of information when it comes to MVIS information. There's also links on there to the CCMTA website. CCMTA are the record keepers for the national safety codes. Standard 11 is what you use for commercial vehicle safeties. So standard 11, you can go to the CCMTA and you can download standard 11 from their website. Now Ontario only enforces part B, but you cannot break up the document. That's one of the locks that's on there from the CCMTA. So when you download Standard 11, you're downloading the entire document. You cannot break it up. If you go to print it, you're printing the entire Standard 11, all 256 pages of it. You can't break it up. Part B starts on page 50. Okay, That's what we enforce. 
Now, if people are saying, holy mackerel, do you know how much that's going to cost? Yes, I do know how much that's going to cost. And you can see why our managers made a, uh, it was an easy decision to say, we're not going to provide that in print. Because when you consider we have approximately 13,000 motor vehicle inspection stations across Ontario and then the distribution network for that, this to us made a whole lot more sense. Making sure that, you know, by utilizing these links, you are getting the most current information. Now, when I made this slide deck up about four months ago, at that time, we had links on there for order forms for safeties, application forms, and um, adding technician forms. As I understand, approximately two weeks ago, I've heard of motor vehicle inspection stations being able to do online ordering of safety standard certificates. I know we are now doing online applications and some of the, of the um, frustrations that go along with that, I realize that. But these changes, once we get all the bugs worked out, I think we're gonna realize that it is going to be a slick operation. Now, the functionality for the online ordering for the safety certificates, I haven't seen it yet. But I've had people tell me that yes, it's there, yes, you can do it, and they've had good luck with it. You may notice when you've placed an order recently for safety certificates, you might be traditionally receiving two, two more order forms with your mailing. You're not getting those anymore. We're encouraging people to go here for our website to do them online. That's part of our attempt at being resourceful and efficient. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, the application process is also going to be, on, it is online as well. Now, I'm going to hang out for a little bit if we have any questions about the light duty standard. Okay. Now, that's my email address and my direct number. Even though I'm giving you my direct number, I'm doing these presentations twice a day until the end of June. So don't call me. And I got a feeling after June, I'm gonna take some vacation. So I would almost say don't call me until August, okay? But I am trying to monitor my email. I'm trying to stay on top of that. So if you have any questions, you want to feel free to you know, say, I'll hang out for a bit. You can talk to me about that. How many of you in here were realized that you had an opportunity to provide feedback or input to this regulation and these changes to the light duty standard? How many of you knew that you could do that? That's one of the benefits that goes along with being a member of an association. Up until nine months ago, the light duty standard and regulation 611 were posted on a website available for public feedback. Now, we received from some feedback, but, um, but truthfully, I don't think it represented all of industry. And that's one of the advantages that, you know what, when you can provide feedback on legislation from a provincial voice and have a unified front on that part of it, it gives you a lot of credibility. Okay, so that opportunity is out there. That's one of the advantages of being a member. So associations get alerts to these regulation changes and they communicate them to their members for their input. That's part of where the associations work for you on that part of it. So as I said, I'll answer some questions for the light duty standard. If you have any questions about uh, memberships for different associations, we've got Jim over here for UCDA, we've got Diane over here for Arrow, and certainly um, if you come out of the session feeling a little bit more informed, a little more comfortable with the light duty standard, I feel like I've done my job. I appreciate your time coming out to this. I realize it takes effort out of your scheduling. So I want to thank you very much for coming out to this. Thank you very much.